Good afternoon, everyone. I hope your day has been going well so far. As we are rapidly approaching the end of the semester, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you all for a great semester. I know this semester has been weird and probably a little rough for some of you, but I really appreciate all the hard work you've put in. And to those of you who have offered me kind words along the way, thank you so much. It means a lot to me. And I hope I've been able to offer you some of that same kindness. So thank you again for a fantastic semester. I could not have asked for a better group of individuals to go through these quarantine recitations with. You all are incredibly talented, and I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. So now, without further ado, let's turn to today's recitation material. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go a little bit fast because we're trying to cover three recitation sections, in, uh, or, or textbook sections, in one day. Now, the diffraction grading is a lot like double slit interference. In fact, double slit interference is a special case of that. So basically, all a diffraction grading is, is it's like double slit interference, but now instead of having two slits, we have lots of slits. So if I were to draw a picture of it, it would look something like this. So we have some slits, um, and these little dots I'm going to use to represent, you know, however many slits we have in the middle there. And then we have some more slits. And we have our screen off to the side, and we're going to use some red laser. So let's suppose we have a bright fringe up here. Well, the light from each of these slits is going to have to pass through and reach this to cause our constructive interference. And there could be lots more of these, so this is just a sampling um, of the light beams that we would see. Now, we still can draw, our setup is still very similar to what we had for double slit interference. So uh, we're gonna have the center of all of our slits somewhere in here, and that is gonna have some length L. And we can draw our line through the middle like we did last time. And we can call this angle here, theta M like we did last time. So if this height here, height of this bright fringe is y sub m, we are still going to have that our relation y sub m is equal to L tangent of theta m. So lucky for us that carries over. Now the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to zoom in on our slits. We're going to get to the point where our uh, light rays all look roughly parallel and we're going to do a little bit of trick and we're going to see that it's going to be the exact same trig as we did with the single slip. But before I erase this, are there any questions so far? I think I misspoke a second ago. I meant to say it's the exact same trig as the double slip. So if we zoom in on this, now I'm going to draw just a few slits here. So let's suppose we have one, two, three, four. But we could generalize this to however many slits we want to. Well, our light's going to come through. And all of it is going to look roughly parallel at the zoomed in level. I mean, we know in reality it's not all perfectly parallel, but if we zoom in far enough, we can reach a place where it looks roughly parallel. And now we can do kind of that same thing we did last time where we drew our center line like this. And this line like this, and we know that this angle here is theta m. Now if you look at the interference that's happening here, well these are going to have some path length difference. And so we can use a little delta r to denote it. And there's going to be some d, some slit width there. And so um, if we want to figure out a relationship for this, well, we know this angle is also going to be theta m, and we know that because of the trick we did last time. I'm going a little bit faster this time around because we've got a lot of material to cover. Uh, but if you want a refresher, if you look at uh, Monday's video, that will show all the algebra we did to get that. So now if we use some trick, we're going to get that, well, this is the opposite side. This is our hypotenuse, so we're going to have that sine of theta m is equal to delta r over d. 
And so this is going to work for any one that we picked. So if instead of looking at this interference here, we had looked at this big triangle here, well, if we double our, our uh, this side here, we're going to get double delta R. And we're also going to get uh, the D is going to double as well. So you have two times here, two times here. The factor of two would cancel out. So um, that's why we're focusing only on this case right here, but it's going to generalize for all of them because they're going to be changing by the same ratio. So if we multiply both sides by D, we're going to get that delta R is equal to D sine theta m. Now recall from last time that we get constructive interference when delta R is equal to m lambda. So we're going to go ahead and set these two expressions equal to each other. We're going to have that m lambda is equal to d sine theta m. Or if we solve out for sine theta m, we're going to have sine theta m is equal to m lambda over d, which should also look familiar. Now the big difference between our diffraction grating and uh, our double slit interference is that we can no longer use a small angle approximation. So usually when we do problems involving the diffraction grating, we're going to have maybe we're looking for the height y sub m, and we're going to need to use this equation to solve out for our angle, and then we'd plug it into the other one, or vice versa. We'd use the first equation to solve for our angle and plug that into this equation. So these two equations right here and here are going to be what we are using for uh, the diffraction grading. So are there any questions so far? All right, so let's hop right into an example. So let's suppose we have a red laser and our red laser has wavelength of 400 nanometers. And it's going to shine through a diffraction grating with a thousand lines per millimeter. And we're going to project this pattern onto a screen that's two meters away from the diffraction grating. So L is equal to two meters. The first thing we want to determine is what is the location of the M equals two bright fringe? So that's part A. So if we look at the information we have here, well, we know what L is, because we know y sub m equals L tan theta, but we don't know what theta is. We do have some information that can help us figure it out using our second equation, the sine uh, theta m equation. So we know that m equals 2, we know lambda is equal to 400 nanometers, but what about this thing right here? This isn't d, but if we reciprocate it, we will get d, because uh, so that slit with different distance, that is some uh, number in meters. And so if we take the how many millimeters we have and we divide that by the number of lines, that's going to give us our slit width difference. So the book likes to a lot of times, instead of giving you D itself, they'll give you the number of lines per meter or centimeter or millimeter. And all you have to do is reciprocate that. Because we know if there's a thousand lines per millimeter, then that means for every one millimeter, we have a thousand lines. So this is D, but we don't want our number in millimeters, we want our number in meters, so we're also going to go ahead right now and convert. So we have 1 meter per 1,000 millimeters, so D is going to be equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. So are there any questions to this point? 
All right, so now we're going to have all the information that we need to solve for our angle. So we know sine theta 2 is equal to m lambda over d. So if we take the arc sine of both sides, we're going to have theta 2 is equal to arc sine of m lambda over d. Now we know m is 2, so this is we're going to have arc sine of 2. Lambda, we're going to convert to meters, so we're going to have 4 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And then d is already in meters, so we're going to have 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. And we're going to go ahead and plug this into our calculator. And we're going to find that theta 2 is equal to about 53.1 degrees. So now that we have our angle, we can go ahead and plug that angle into the L tan theta equation. to L tan theta. Well, we said our screen was two meters away, so we have two meters tangent of 53.1 degrees. We're going to go ahead and plug that into our calculator. And that's going to work out to be about 2.67 meters or to two sig figs, this is going to work out to be 2.7 meters. So are there any questions on part A? All right, so part B asks us, how far apart are the m equals 1 and m equals 2 bright fringes? So. You want to know how far apart are m equals 1 and m equals 2 bright fringes. So what is that question asking us for? Well, it's asking us for the difference between y2 and y1 ultimately, because if we know y2 and we know y1 and we take that difference, that difference is going to tell us how far apart our bright fringes are. Now, we know what y2 is, we don't know what y1 is, but luckily we can use the exact same process we did before since none of our values are changing except for y. So I'm going to go straight to our equation for theta. We know theta1 is equal to arc sine of m lambda over d. And now m is going to be just 1, so we're going to have our sine of 1 times 4.0 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. All of this divided by 1.0 times 10 to the minus 6 meters. And this is going to work out to give us an angle of theta 1 is equal to 23.6 degrees. So we can go ahead and plug that into our L tan theta equation. y1 equals l tan theta 1, so that's going to be 2 meters tan of 23.6 degrees, which is going to work out to be about 0.837 or 873 meters. 
So if we want to know y2 minus y1, well, we know y2 was 2.67 meters, and we're subtracting 0.873 meters. This will work out to be about 1.794 meters. Or to two sig figs, we're going to have y2 minus y1 is equal to 1.8 meters. So are there any questions on this example? All right. So next we're going to move into single slit diffraction. And so I'm going to real quick screen share with you that slide from last class where we talked about double and single slit diffraction. If we look here at, this is that slide from the slideshow. And so this is the one with the single slit and you can see there's this big bright fringe here. And it's a little hard to see, but if you look closely, you can see there's a bright fringe right here. Another one on the other side. There's a bright fringe over here and another one on the other side. So you can see that, yes, there's a big bright spot in the middle, but we also have these little fringes. So what exactly is going on there? How is the light interfering with itself? Well, to think about this, it's helpful to think about, instead of thinking about um, our light as just like a beam of photons that are all marching along single file in a straight line, our light beam is made up of a lot of photons and they're not all, you know, marching along single file. They're kind of doing their own thing. There's, they're going to line up. You're going to have lots of little photons. And this is a very small representation of them. And each one is going to have its own little diffraction happening. So when they come through the slit, all of these little diffraction patterns are going to interfere with each other. And that's what's going to ultimately end up creating our diffraction grading pattern on the screen. So that's kind of conceptually what happens with single slit diffraction is we get, uh, we get a big bright spot in the middle because, you know, there's a lot of uh, constructive interference happening in the middle. But we also get some bright fringes in other places because we also have some other points of constructive interference. So if you want to work through this mathematically, we're going to take a representative sample of particles. So we're going to start with eight photons, which is uh, very much an oversimplification. We have way more than eight, but to make things manageable, we're going to suppose we have eight photons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And instead of looking at the places of constructive interference, we're going to try and figure out where a destructive interference is happening. So we have some spot of destructive interference somewhere off in the distance. And so we have beams of photons that are traveling out to reach that point. And uh, our screen is way, way off screen. So we're at the zoomed in level where our lines are going to look basically parallel, even though they're not completely parallel. But they're going to look basically parallel. Now, if we want destructive interference, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pair our lines off. So I'm going to say I want line one and line five to perfectly destructively interfere. So I'm going to pair, pair one with five. And then we're going to have five is paired with one. And we're going to draw ourselves a little triangle. I'm going to do the exact same thing for the other one. So I'm going to pair 2 with 6, and 6 with 2, 3 with 7, 7 with 3, and 4 with 8, 8 with 4. Now you'll notice these all have the same length here. So going from 1 to 5 is the same as going from 2 to 6 is the same as going from 3 to 7 is the same as going from 4 to 8. So if we can make 1 and 5 destructively interfere perfectly, then we can do the same thing with 2 and 6, 3 and 7, so on and so forth. 
Now to have perfect destructive interference here, our path length different distance delta r is going to ha have to be um, m plus a half lambda. So we learned last week or the week before that to get destructive interference, we need delta r equals m plus one half lambda. Now, instead of having um, calling this the distance width of our slit D, we're going to use the letter A here just to distinguish it from the double slit in diffraction grading cases. So we're going to call this whole distance here, going from here to here, that whole width is A. Now, going from 1 to 5, that's only going to be half. So this length here is going to be A over 2 instead of A. So if we call this angle theta m, like we did before with our other triangles, when we go ahead and do our trig, we're going to get that sine theta m is equal to delta r divided by a over 2. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by a over 2 to get delta r by itself. We're going to have delta r equals a over 2 sine theta m. Now I'm going to set the two delta r expressions equal to each other. So we're going to have m plus 1 half times lambda is equal to a over 2 sine theta m. So I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by 2 here because I don't like having this 2 hanging out in this denominator. And I'm going to distribute it inside the parentheses. So we're going to get 2m here and we're going to get 1 here. So we're going to have 2m plus 1 times lambda is equal to a sine theta m. And if we divide both sides by a, we would have the, an expression that looks a lot like what we had for the double slit interference and the diffraction grating, but the number we have out front is an m. It's something a little bit different. So uh, if we think about what values we can get for this, if we plug in m equals 0, well, this would give us 1 lambda. If we plug in m equals 1, well, we'd have 2 plus 1 would give us 3 lambda. If you plug in 2, we're going to have 2 uh, times 2 is 4 plus 1, so 5 lambda. So we'll get all of the odd multiples of lambda this way. But what about the even ones? Is there a way we can generate the even multiples so we have something that's more like what we have for our double slit and uh, diffraction grading? Well, there is a way to do that. So what I'm going to go ahead is I'm going to pair off our lines a little bit differently, and we're going to see that if you pair them off differently, this number out front ends up changing. So now, I'm going to pair 1 with 3. And 3 with 1, and then I'm going to pair 2 with 4, 4 with 2, I'm going to pair 5 with 7, 7 with 5, 6 with 8, and 8 with 6. So now, if we want 1 and 3 to perfectly destructively interfere, well, the, dis the, the difference between 1 and 3 is the same as the distance between 2 and 4, is the same as the distance between 5 and 7, so on and so forth. So if we can make 1 and 3 perfectly destructively interfere, then we can make all the other ones perfectly destructively interfere. So, we're going to draw our low right triangle again. That's very small, unfortunately, so it's a little hard to see. But it's still going to have some path length difference, delta r. But this side here, instead of being a over 2, it's now going to be a over 4. So we still are going to have delta r is equal to m plus a half lambda because we're looking for destructive interference. But our equation is going to look a little different this time. So if we do our trig, we're going to get that sine of theta 
is equal to delta r divided by a over 4. Now I'm going to multiply both sides by a over 4, and we're going to get that delta r is equal to a over 4 sine theta. Now I'm going to set our two delta r expressions equal to each other. So we're going to have m plus a half lambda is equal to a over 4 sine theta. Multiply both sides by 4 to get rid of the 4 in the denominator here. So we're going to have, and I'm going to distribute it inside the parentheses, so we're going to have 4m plus 2 times lambda is equal to a sine theta. So now, if we plug in 0 here, we're going to get 2 lambda, so that's an even integer. If we plug in 2, well, we'll have, uh, or 1, sorry, we'll have 4 times 1 is 4 plus 2 is 6. If you plug in 2, well, we're going to get 10 here. So we're not getting all the even integers, but we're getting 2, we're getting 6, we're getting 10, we're getting half of them. And it turns out that we can get all of them if we just pair them up differently. So the next way we'd want to do it is we'd try pairing up ones that are a over 6 apart, and then we could try pairing up ones that are a over 8 apart, a over 10, so on and so forth. And eventually, we would be able to get all of our integers this way. So, we're going to use the letter P to denote that coefficient out front, and that's just to simplify our notation here, because we have all these different combinations that we could have, and it's kind of ugly, so we're going to use the letter P to denote it. So we're going to say that P lambda is equal to A sine theta. Now, P is going to be some integer, but notice that even though m can equal 0, P is not going to be 0, because when we plugged it into where we just had uh, the 2m plus 1, plug in m equals 0, you get 1 lambda. Plug it in here, we get 2 lambda. There's not going to be a situation where you can get uh, P equals 0, and that's important because at that m equals 0 space, um, that center line we have maximum constructive interference. So this is for destructive interference. So we have P equals 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth. And this is destructive interference. So these are our dark fringes. So are there any questions up to here? Now the nice thing is that we can use our small angle approximation here again. So we learned last time that the small angle approximation tells us that for very small angles, sine theta is about equal to tan theta. So we can still have, we're still going to have the height of our fringe, and now it's a dark fringe instead of a bright fringe, so we're going to use the letter P is equal to L tan theta. And the rationale is exactly the same as when we were doing this for um, our um, other two cases. But uh, So you'll still be able to draw that little triangle. And so now we can go ahead and plug in, since tan theta and sine theta are about the same, well, we know that sine theta is equal to p lambda over a, so we can replace this with p lambda over a. So we're going to have l times p lambda over a. So the location of our dark fringes is going to be given by p lambda l over a using the small angle approximation. And that just makes our life a little simpler. So we could use these other equations if we wanted to, but if we can skip steps and use a small angle approximation, that makes things faster. So are there any questions up to this point? All right, so one more thing relating to interference, we're gonna talk about the width of that central maximum, that bright spot we have right in the center. So when we look at our, at that image of uh, single slit diffraction, we have 
a bright spot, and it's pretty wide right in the center. And then we had dark fringes all over here and over here. And then we had thinner bright fringes here and here. And then we had more dark fringes here and here. Now, this dark fringe here is going to be P equals 1. And since it's symmetric, we also call this one P equals 1 because we measure from the center. So you can think there's like an axis going through the center here. And this is going to be y equals 0. And we measure our height y going this way or this way. So that's going to be P equals 1. We're going to have P equals 2 over here. And so if we want to know the width of the central maximum, well, if we find y1, and we double it, because this is also y1, that's going to give us the width of our central maximum. So I'm going to use the letter w to denote uh, our width. We're going to have the w is equal to 2y1. Well, that's 2, and we just said that y1 was lambda lp over a. And so w is equal to 2 um, lambda l. Now, y1 is p equals 1. So we're going to have 1 oh, times 1 over a. And so the 1 is just we can just get rid of. And so we're going to have that w is equal to 2 lambda l over a. And that's how we'd find the width of that central maximum. So are there any questions on this? All right, so let's move into an example. And so, let's suppose we have a red laser again. And so lambda is equal to 400 nanometers. We're going to shine that through a single slit. We put our screen 0.5 meters behind the slit, so L equals 0.50 meters. And we measure the distance between the first and second dark fringes on the screen. So the di distance between the first and second dark fringes, that's going to be y2 minus y1. And we find that that's 0.45 centimeters. We want to know how wide is the slit, so we're looking for W. Well, to do this, the first thing you're going to want to do is convert centimeters to meters. So I'm going to make this, this is the same thing as 0 0.0045 meters. And now we're going to go ahead and write out what Y2 and Y1 are. So we know that it's the same thing as M, or not M, we use P here because we're talking about destructive interference. So we're going to have for um, the single slit, so we're going to have P lambda L over A. And so Y2, our P is 2, so this is going to be 2 lambda L over A minus this one's going to be 1 lambda L over A. And if we're subtracting 1 lambda L from 2, we're going to be left with 1 lambda, so lambda L over A. And that's equal to 0 0.0045 meters. We want to know, wait, we're not looking for W. Sorry, our brain is a little bit scrambled today. We're looking for A because we want to know how wide is the um, the slit itself, not the width of the central maximum. Uh, my dissertation defense is tomorrow, so between crunching three lectures worth of material down into one and practicing my dissertation, my brain is a little fried, so I apologize. What we're looking for here ultimately is A. So we're going to go ahead and multiply both sides by A. 
And we're going to get that lambda L is equal to A times 0 0.0045 meters. We want A by itself, so we're going to divide both sides by 0 0.0045 meters. So we're going to have, let's see, I'll put it up here. that A is equal to lambda L divided by 0 0.0045 meters. So we're going to have, we're going to convert, convert to nanometers to meters, so we're going to have 4.0 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. Our L is 0 0.50 meters, and then we're dividing by 0 0.0045 meters. So we're going to end up with A is equal to about 4.4 times 10 to the minus 5 meters. So are there any questions on this example? All right, if there are no questions on this, we're going to move into our last topic for today, which is circular aperture diffraction. And so what if instead of using a slit, so with our single slit, we just cut a little slit in paper and shine light through it. What if instead of creating a slit, we make a little pinprick, a little circular pinprick in our paper? Well, the diffraction pattern you're going to see is going to look something like this. You're going to have a big bright spot in the middle. And then you're going to have a dark ring. And then you're going to have another circular bright spot out here, you're going to have another dark ring, you're going to have another circular bright spot. Um, and Mr. Jayish posted a really nice video uh, demonstration of this in the week 13 uh, plan, so if you haven't seen that yet, I would recommend it. It's a very short video, but it shows what the diffraction pattern actually looks like. Now the thing about circular aperture diffraction is that the mathematics is a little bit complicated for us. So the nice thing is, I'm just going to straight up give you the equations, we're not going to try deriving them. So, the first thing we may want to know about is, what about our angle? What angle do we have for our uh, first bright spot? So theta 1 is going to be equal to 1.22 lambda divided by d where d is the diameter of the slit, or not slit, the, um, the circle. Now, another thing you might want to know is the width of our central maximum. Well, we can use w equals 2y1 for the same reason that we were able to use that when we had the single slit. Um, some of this is analogous to the single slit. Some of the math is a little more complicated, like with this equation right here. But the w equals 2y1, you know, you can reason through in the same way that that bright spot, well, if our dark spot, that height going from the center to there, we call y1, then the width of that has to be twice y1. And we can still use that um, y1 equals l tan theta1. So we're going to have this is going to be the same thing as 2L tan theta 1. Now we're going to be able to use our small angle approximation here. And there is another statement of the small angle approximation. So up to this point, we've used that sine theta is about equal to tan theta. But they're both about equal to theta itself. So another formulation of the small angle approximation is that sine theta well, is about the same thing as tan theta. That's also equal to theta itself. <coughs> so if we go ahead, we substitute theta, uh, excuse me, theta into here. We're going to have w is equal to 2l theta. And we can take this and plug this in for theta. So there's going to be 2l times 1.22 lambda over d. So if we think this simplify this a little bit, we're going to get the W is equal to 
2.44 L lambda over D. So are there any questions on that? All right, so we're gonna move into our last example for the day. And we're gonna go kind of parallel to the others. We're gonna work with a red laser again. So we're going to have lambda is equal to 400 nanometers. And now we're going to just shine it through our circular aperture, so that little pin prick. And with our screen, we're going to place 0.5 meters away again. So we're going to have L equals 0.50 meters. And let's suppose that we measure the width of that central maximum. And we find that it's equal to 0.35 centimeters. So W equals 0.35 centimeters. We want to know what is the diameter of our circular hole. So what is D? Well, we know that W is equal to 2.44 lambda L over D. So if we want to solve for D, we're going to multiply both sides by D and divide by W. We're going to have that D is equal to, to 2.44 lambda L over W. Well, this is going to be 2.44. We're going to multiply by uh, our wavelengths is going to be 4.0 times 10 to the minus 7 meters, converting from nanometers to meters. L is already in meters, so we're going to have 0.50 meters. And then W, we also have to convert, so that's going to be 0 0.0035 meters. And we're going to plug this into our calculator, and we're going to see that D is equal to about 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4 meters to 2 sig figs. So are there any questions on this example? Are there any questions on anything that we've covered today? I know I've thrown a lot of material at you at once, um, but the questions will hopefully be helpful. The examples we've done will hopefully help you think about how to think about the homework problems. Is there anything else that uh, you have questions on? All right, well, if you have no further questions, that's all I have for you for today. So have a great day.